So we're going to compute the area enclosed by r squared equals 4 cos 2 theta. So there's a couple of tricky parts with this. One of them is we have an r squared right here. And the other one is it's not just cos theta, but it's cos 2 theta. So it's going to spin twice as fast as we think. Or another way to think about it, values will repeat pi from 0 to pi. And then pi to 2 pi, those values are going to repeat. So let's go ahead. I think a graph would be a good way to start on this one, uh, mainly because if I had only um, two minutes to do this problem, I would assume pi went from zero or uh, theta went from zero to two pi. But I just want to be sure that that's the case. That's probably what one loop is. But we want to actually uh, plot some points and see what a loop actually is. When we plot points. We're going to be plotting an r and a theta value, so I'm going to go ahead and solve for r. So r is going to be plus or minus 2 square root cos 2 theta. So we'll make our table of values. Uh, let's find some symmetry first. So right away, I can see my function is it's got a cosine. So automatically, I can plug in negative theta to get the same thing. So for symmetry, I can replace theta with negative theta, just looking at the fact that we're using cosine function. That'll be true. So that's x-axis. There's another symmetry we get. And you can see it in the r squared. So right away. Does it matter if r is positive or negative? We're going to be squaring it out. So r could be replaced by negative r. So that's another symmetry we're going to get. So if it's been a few years since you took pre-calculus 2 class, your trigonometry class, let's think about what symmetry this is. So I'm going to draw a point in quadrant 1. I'm intentionally drawing it so the x and y coordinates are not the same. Whenever I draw a default point, I usually choose a smaller y coordinate. This would be a really bad point to pick, kind of in between where your x and y coordinates are similar. A decent point would be where your y coordinate is bigger than your x. That would be another good generic point to draw. So what I want to do, keep theta, but make r negative. What does that do? So this point here is r theta. Where would negative r theta be? So I have a direction. Instead of going r that direction, we're going to go minus r that direction. So we're going to go the opposite direction. So we're going to be down here. This is negative r theta. So these points are symmetric, but not symmetric with respect to an axis. What symmetry do we call this? Origin. You rotate, rotate halfway around. So we get origin symmetry and x-axis symmetry. With symmetries, you can't have two. You can either have 0, 1, or all three. So right away, I get all three symmetries. So this is good news. What that means is when I make my table of values, if I know quadrant 1, I can use x-axis symmetry to get quadrant 2. So x-axis gives me 2. And then rotate it halfway around gives me 3 and 4. Oh, I said that wrong. So use x-axis to get 4, flip it over, and then rotate to get 2 and 3. So all we need to do is get quadrant 1. So let's go ahead and use every theta value we know in quadrant 1. So we're going from 0 to pi over 2. Now I'm going to be doubling theta first.
then taking cosine. And now square rooting. I'm just writing on the positive square roots. We'll plot the negative square roots separately. So I'm just going with the positive square roots here. So a square root of one half. I will need a decimal for this. Can one of you type your calculators to get the square root of 0.5 or square root of a half? So 0 0.707, we'll go 0 0.71. <clears throat> What's wrong with square root negative one half? That's imaginary. We're not plotting imaginary numbers, so we're not going to be plotting those angles right there. So they're out. Okay, so we only have three points to plot. Then we're going to be using symmetry, getting other points. Our Biggest radius, oh, I did not multiply by two. Better do that right now. Two square root cos theta, two, 1.42, and zero. Now you should be careful when you're plotting these, you do not use the two theta column when you plot points. That You don't use any of the middle, the interior columns, but I'm crossing out the two theta column because I don't want to look at those angles. I want to look at the theta angles. So our first point, our theta is two zero, then 1.42 comma pi over six, Drawing in the pi over four angles, pi over six, pi over three. I'm gonna need the angles on the other side as well. So first point two zero, and then 1.42 pi over six and then zero. So I get those three points. Let's connect them with a curve. So this is our graph so far. Any questions on these points? Now I'm going to make our negative. So I'm going to plot all these three points again, but I am intentionally making the R values negative. This is the negative square root that we get. So I have negative two, same angle, but negative 1.42 will be down in quadrant three, and then we're reusing the origin. So we get these three points on the left Connect them together with the curve. We sort of have a sideways S looking shape right here. So any questions on those three? All right, apply both symmetries one at a time. Do X axis first. So flip this over and then rotate halfway around. So apply them separately. So do that right now x-axis first.
I applied x-axis symmetry. I also apply the other two symmetries. There's no more work to do. You rotate this halfway around, you get the same thing. Or you could flip it across the y-axis and get the same thing. So the other symmetry was already here. And I think this is called either a propeller or a rose petal. More an infinity. Or a figure eight if I would have done it vertically. <clears throat> All right, this question just said area enclosed by. I'm not sure if it's one or both, so let's just compute one of them. And then if it was both, we'll just double it. So we'll just do the area of one of these. Uh, now I do want to warn you, chances are if I, so if I orient this, I didn't really pay much attention to which one went first. So two zero and the orientation would go to the left on that first little part of the curve I drew. And then just continuing that around, it's going to drop back down through. And then as I come back, I'll be going the other direction. Now we think about these regions here. Let's think about the region on the right. Now I told you the orientation, if you go the wrong way around, you'll get a negative area. So right away, I can tell that, I'm not sure which one would be positive and negative, but because we're gonna rotate opposite directions, if I compute the area of both at the same time, they're gonna cancel each other out. Because one's gonna be positive and one's gonna be negative. Because I'm rotating, let's see, the one on the left, I'm going clockwise. The one on the right, I'm going counter. So if I want the area, total area, I can, I'd have to do them separately or just compute one and double it. But if I compute the entire area in one integral, I'm gonna get zero just because the orientation is going to cancel out. So we'll just go for the area on the right side. Now if I start, pi, if I start theta at zero, I'm going to begin over here. But that's going to be bad because we saw the way that this went. I will go all the way over on the left side before I come back to the right. So I don't want to start at theta equals zero. what I should do is start and end at the origin here. So I wanna go from the origin in the orientation that's laid out. How do I figure out that starting theta value? I can't tell the angle, but what is the radius there? Zero, let's use that information. I wanna go from radius zero to radius zero, and I need to pass by theta equals zero. So looking up here, that's, the, that's my final theta value right there. That's my ending theta value will be, well, I don't know why I circled zero. My ending theta value will be pi over four, corresponding to the radius of zero. Now I have to look back up how far I have to go past zero in order to get back to radius zero. When is the next time I will have radius zero? Negative pi over four. So we could see that just by using the fact that cosine's even. Cosine pi over four equals cosine negative pi over four. Now it's a little bit trickier because it's really, cosine's really eating the pi over two angle, but Still pi over two, negative pi over two, cosine doesn't care. So we're gonna go from negative pi over four to positive pi over four. That's gonna be our uh, bounds for theta. We have our formula for area, I'll write that down. So it's integral double integral over r, one r dr d theta. So d theta negative, 
goes, or theta goes negative pi over 2, pi over 4, to pi, to pi over 4. Okay, those are our theta bounds. Now I need the R bounds. So that's a little bit tricky. So the curve I'm doing is just a positive version here. So is this 2 square root cos 2 theta, is that the upper bound or the lower bound? That's the upper bound. If that was a lower bound, I would be getting the infinite area all outside here. So that's the upper bound. What's the lower bound? Tricky to see from the graph. So we're going to go with 0 because I don't want to let the radius go past the origin. So I want this loop here. Uh, now, if, <clears throat> I'm going to draw some cross sections in here. You cannot erase this many times, so don't bother drawing these in. But I'm going to draw radial cross sections. So we're going to go from the origin out. And they're going to look like this. This is what cross sections look like here in polar coordinates. And if you draw cross sections, it should be pretty clear that they're going from 0, r equals 0, out to the max, which is r equals 2 square root cos 2 theta. So that's why we're going from 2 to that, or from 0 to that function. Can I further use symmetry? So I already said the two loops or two propeller blades have the same area. Even within one of these, can I use symmetry? So there's upper half and lower half that should be exactly the same. So you can use symmetry again. So let's go ahead and use symmetry. So I'm going to get two. That's going to affect the angles, not the radius, but the angles. So I would like to go from 0 to positive pi over 4. So I'm going to do the upper half. Now you may be worried about that square root. Don't worry, it's just an endpoint. We'll get to it in a minute. So antiderivative r is 1 half r squared. So our 2 cancels our half. So I'm going to plug this in to square root cos 2 theta squared d theta. So we have 2 squared is 4. So this is as far as we're going to go. That's plenty, plenty far for you to finish the problem off. That's an easy U sub if you need it. I would probably just go guess and check. My guess would be sine 2 theta. And then see if it should be 2 sine 2 theta or a half sine 2 theta. You mean pi over 2? That should be pi over 4. So this region R is bounded by y equals 0 and y equals square root 1 minus x squared. 
What's wrong with this question being in this 15.4 section? It's not polar. So we're in polar integral section and I gave you a question that's not polar. But what looks circular-ish to you? X squared plus Y squared. There we go. So let's write down, we're about to do some conversions. So we have Cartesian, I want to go to polar. Let's write down there four equations to convert. Most of the time you're using about one or two, sometimes three. So these are conversion, polar to Cartesian. x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, y over x equals tan theta. other uh, conversion you're going to need dy dx is the same as dx dy. Of course changing the order changes your endpoints but that's not what I'm worried about here. When I go to polars do not make this mistake. What is missing if I change dy dx to polars? There's another r. So don't forget the extra r that you pick up. So when I convert, not only does x and y change to polars, but my dy dx or dx dy needs to turn into polar r dr d theta. So now we have our conversion coordinates up. So we can write double integral over r e to the x squared plus y squared dy dx equals double integral still over the region, it's now e to the r squared, r dr d theta. So I've converted to polar coordinates, there's only one more thing to do, which is actually turn our region into proper bounds. One of the nice notations or nice things about this notation here where you're just saying the double integral over r. I could even write double integral over r e x squared plus y squared dx dy. I can change the order because I'm just saying we're over r. I didn't write down the actual endpoints. So not very good for computation. I have to write down the endpoints to compute, but for notation it's very simple to switch like this. So now we need to figure out what type of region we're working with. What do we do to figure out this region? So we could do the clueless method, but we're just going to, if I, we definitely used the clueless method before, but the only reason we used it was to get a graph. So I need to know what my region looks like, and then I have a shot at converting it. So we're going to graph our region out first. It's not going to look like that. So we're going to graph this out first. Y equals 0 is the x-axis. So there's our y equals 0. And y equals square root 1 minus x squared. So you might think this is a parabola. Why is this definitely not a parabola? Square root's messing it up, so it's not a parabola. Let's make this less ugly by squaring both sides and then adding x squared to the other side. So what graph is x squared plus y squared equals 1? Circle. There is a difference between the original equation and the bottom equation. Obviously there's a square root in the first equation. There is an unwritten restriction on y. 
what could y, what kind of values could y not have in the first, the original equation? Y can't be negative. So there's an unwritten assumption also that y is greater than or equal to zero. There are limitations on x, but you can see those limitations in the square root, or in the uh, squared version at the bottom. So x can't get too big, but x can't get too big in the unit circle equation anyways. All right, so we have a unit circle, and y has to be positive. So that's easy to graph out. It's the upper half of the unit circle right there. We also have the y equals 0. So that's our region R. So I want you right now to describe the polar, uh, what R needs to go between and what theta needs to go between. So you are looking at a polar rectangle. I want to know what values theta is between and what values R is between. So both these are starting at zero. What's the maximum theta value? So we've got zero to pi. And what about r? So zero to one. A good way to think about this is a windshield wiper on your car, where it's just going, moving across. So windshield wiper works in polar coordinates. Well, some of them are a little funky, but the one on your car most likely just moves in a polar coordinate type manner. So that's how you want to think about polar rectangles. There's some length of your windshield wiper. Windshield wiper is kind of boring because it only makes semicircles. But if it could change lengths as well, that would be a little more accurate. But there's a radial motion, a theta, change in theta, and then there's a distance or an r. Okay, so we're ready to write down the uh, area written with endpoints here. So we got area equals double integral e to the r squared r dr d theta. The r is inside endpoint 0, 1. The theta is the outside 0 to pi. Our region is very symmetric, but why am I not allowed to use symmetry? What more information do I need to know to actually use symmetry here? Are we computing the area of this region? We are not. If I was getting the area of the region, I'd be using, in place of that function, I'd be having one. So I'm not looking for the area. I'm looking for a volume of this function over the region. So I better be sure the shape of the function, the volume of the function of the region needs to be symmetric if I'm going to use symmetry. So I'm not computing area here. So there's a little more information I need to know before I use symmetry. Uh, now that you see it written e to the r squared, does that function depend on theta? So it shouldn't matter what theta is. So I'm using a little bit too much insight here and not enough being careful, but this function doesn't change values depending on theta. It changes on how far you are from the origin. So <clears throat> I could use symmetry, but I'm not going to. We'll just uh, compute this out. How in the world do I get the R antiderivative? So your first trick you learned, aside from the regular antiderivative rules, is a U sub. So I recommend go use sub first. And there's only one reasonable choice. Don't use r, because if you ever let u equal r, du equals dr, and all you did was change your letter from r to u. So never make that substitution. You're going to waste your time. Now if we go with r squared. u is r squared. We're picking it because I see r squared right there. 
So du is 2r dr. And I don't have a 2, so I'll move it to the 1 half. du equals r dr. There's r dr. This is our first u substitution. At least I think our first u substitution that, with a multiple integral. So I'm going to do this carefully. All I'm changing is things inside the green parentheses. That's why I put them there. I'm not messing around with any of the theta stuff outside. You can move constants through both integrals, yeah. I'm just going to move it through one for now so that I don't mess with the outer integral. So are there any calculus U sub questions? I do not uh, worry about my endpoints until I unsub. So you could convert your endpoints to U's, but I'm going to leave them out until I come back into R's in this case. So I'm not going to worry about endpoints for a minute. This is the easiest antiderivative of all time. Antiderivative e to the u is e to the u. I'll move the 1 half all the way to the front now. Still have the endpoints missing. They're about to be written in because I'm unsubstituting. So now I have e to the r squared. And we're going from 0 to 1. So e to the 1 minus e to the 0. So that is e minus 1 d theta. 0 to pi. So this integral is easy enough to finish. What's the antiderivative of e minus 1? It's almost e minus theta. So e minus 1 is a number. So the antiderivative of that number, e minus 1, is that number times theta. So it's all e minus 1 theta from 0 to pi. And that's, I think, far enough for us. Just remember, e is a number. e minus 1 is another number. All right, I gave you a Cartesian question, and we turned it to polars. When you take your final exam, I won't tell you that this question comes from the polar coordinate section. So you're going to have to look and determine what, if any part of this, tells me it should be in polar. So there were two parts in here. The x squared plus y squared was one clue. There was a second clue that was probably less obvious. We actually had a unit circle. So think about if you have y equals square root 1 minus x squared you're actually looking at a circle or part of a circle. Can you solve it without converting? That's a good question. Uh, so just looking at it, if it was in this order, I have my dy integral to do first. That means y is my variable, x is not. So I would write this as e to the x squared, which would be a number, times e to the y squared. 
It really comes down to, can you integrate that? If the answer is yes, then go for it. But the reason we could do it in polars is because there's basically, not an extra Y, but there is exactly what I needed for the U sub was right there. So I gained the exact term I needed for a U sub. Uh, I would say integration by parts. The problem is you're probably going to have to let dV equal 1 or something weird like that. I can take a derivative of e to the y squared, but not an anti At least I don't know what the antiderivative would be. So that would be what I would get hung up on. Maybe with Wolfram and an hour I could do it. Uh, but during my final, probably not. There also are plenty of impossible integrals that can't be solved. You can estimate the solution, but you can actually solve them the way that we're doing them. All right, so our next example. So this will be written as an integral 0, 1, negative 1, uh, negative square root 1 minus x squared to 0. y dx. So this question is in the polar coordinate section. That's a big hint. We're going to use polar integral. But if you didn't know it was in this section, what are your hints that this could be a polar integral? So you're looking at r squared. That's not the only hint. So the two hints right here so we got r squared equals x squared plus y squared. So that's the obvious hint that you probably saw first. Now the less obvious hint, that negative square root 1 minus x squared, that's going to be a y equals negative square root 1 minus x squared. Square both sides. y squared equals 1 minus x squared. And we have x squared plus y squared equals 1. So we have the unit circle. Which part of the unit circle do we actually have? This time we got the bottom half because y was negative. So there's an unwritten y is less than or equal to 0. So we can draw our region. Bottom half of the unit circle. So that was our lower bound was at negative square root. The upper bound was y equals 0. That was our upper bound, y equals 0. I actually drew too much of this circle. What I have not yet used are the bounds on x. So I'm supposed to go from x equals 0 to x equals 1. What x bounds does my region actually use? Negative 1 to 1. So my region is twice the region it should be. So let's, which half should I keep, left or right? So I want to go from x equals 0 to x equals 1. So that will be just the right part of the region there. So that's x equals 0 to x equals 1. So now we know the region that we are describing. Any questions about getting to the region? I know it takes a while. You've got to convert. Carefully look at what your equations that define the boundaries are. All right, I want you to go all the way from this information, write out the integral in polar coordinates. So our x squared plus y squared becomes r squared, just like before. And our dx dy becomes r dr d theta. So right in the polar bounds for this region r.
So we're on the unit circle, so our radius goes 0 to 1. That's how you uh, go all the way from the origin out to the edge. So that's 0 to 1. What about theta? What values, what does theta start at? Negative pi over 2. And what is theta going to end at? Negative pi over 2 to 0. So you're sweeping out this region R from negative pi over 2 to 0. So there should be an easy antiderivative, anti-power rule, plug in the endpoints, you'll get a number, and that should be very easy, straightforward to do. So I'm going to just leave this one right here. We're going to find the volume of a solid. Bounded above. By Z equals nine minus X squared minus Y squared. And below by the unit circle in the X Y plane. So let's look at the, the unit circle in the xy plane that's pretty easy to think about. So let's look at the other equation, the z equation here. I want to, I'm going to write this with x squared plus y squared, so I'm going to factor out or bring the negative sign out front. So it's 9 minus x squared plus y squared. So I'm just bringing the negative out front. So this is the upper part, the upper z coordinate right here. What will the lower z coordinate be? The unit plane in the, or the unit circle in the xy plane. So that will be the z equals zero. Here's the unit circle. Right here, if I was better at drawing, it's supposed to appear in the xy plane. It will look more like that right there. The circle should be in the xy plane. And unit circle goes to 1 and 1. Let's not go all the way out. All right, how, what was one way we graphed in three dimensions? There's a few different ways. One way we did it badly when we tried to actually graph in three dimensions. There was a way we graphed in two dimensions that represented a three-dimensional surface. So we're going to do cross-sections or uh, inverse images. So we're going to pick z-coordinates and then graph out what those look like. So one super important z-coordinate should be pretty obvious z equals 0. So when z equals 0, what does this function look like? And then, do I want z to go up after that or down? So we'll call this f of xy. So I want to know what is f inverse of 0. <clears throat> now we're bounded below by the unit circle, so that means my z coordinates need to get bigger. So we, are, we want to be below by the unit circle, so we're going to look at what happens when z is 0. Then we'll go z is 1, z is 2. There is a maximum z value you can hit. We'll find that out very quickly because we're subtracting x squared plus y squared. So we just have time to do f inverse of 0. So it's going to be all x and y such that 
0 equals 9 minus x squared plus y squared. So I can solve for the x squared plus y squared equals 9. What will this look like? Circle of radius 3. So we'll do f inverse of a few other uh, values next.